It's been two long years, but four years of longing. We Spider-Man fans had nothing since 2014's frankly crap Amazing Spider-Man 2, and if you didn't like that, the first game or Edge of Time, we had nothing since 2010. That's eight years. We've been waiting. The hype train since the E3 2016 announcement was utterly unstoppable, and every E3 since then has been nothing more to me than patiently waiting for the Spider-Man section at Sony's press conference. Insomniac and Sony released enough trailers to fill a few hours of video, and even painted a train with a striking red advertisement to make a literal hype train. It's been two years that felt like two decades, and so it feels surreal to say that Marvel Spider-Man is finally here, and that it is the game we wanted it to be. This video is very long, and will contain non-major spoilers throughout, until the story section which will be about as spoilery as you can get. So feel free to skip around using the timestamps and proceed at your own caution. If you give the slightest toss about Spider-Man stories and haven't played or watched this game, please don't let me ruin it for you. In this video I will criticise almost every aspect of the game, from the combat to the swinging to the end game, and there wouldn't be much point if I didn't call out flaws with the game, no matter how small. So yeah, I'm going to be nitpicking everything. This game is a marvel, but it's far from perfect. Let's find out how and why. The first thing you'll see when playing Spider-Man PS4 is that there's a lot of stuff to see. Seeing is like playing, in that they're both utterly incredible. This is pretty much the best looking game I've ever played, and that's coming from a guy who has a full series on the Crisis games. I think while the potentially superior God of War needs to do a lot of close-up work, Spider-Man is mostly viewed at a distance, so some scenes look practically photorealistic. Whatever magic they employed is irrelevant, what results is Spider-Suit so beautiful it still amazes me on my second playthrough, and the best looking city in games as a whole. Comparing this game to The Amazing Spider-Man 2, both of which were on the same generation by the way, is staggering. All the buildings have full 3D features, detailed roofs, and fairly variable appearances. The notable towers have never looked better. Citizens look good, there's basketball games with actual animations and balls lying about that you can threaten everyone with. The cars look strangely muscled to me, and upon second inspection I think it might be because they're all the same car. There's a couple models, but most of them are just GTA ripoffs of a Ford Mondeo. Where the game really kills it is with the the lighting. Nighttime New York looks very, very good. The lights, especially at Times Square, are really something to appreciate. A less bland night sky would have gone a long way though. One of the community's most requested features was rain, and Insomniac delivered. There is rain twice in the story. Rain's my favourite type of weather, I find it oddly calming. Still can't think of why, but I do know that the combination of web swinging and this excellent realisation of the gloomy downpour creates an amazingly relaxing experience. In the noir suit it feels like I'm playing Mafia 2. I wish there'd be more puddles during this time of day, and maybe rain streaking down the windows, but I did appreciate that citizens would bring out their umbrellas. At day and sunset, the game looks simply immaculate. The orange afternoon is the de facto time of day for Spider-Man, and this game nails it. The beautiful glow is reflected by the glass of buildings so well that it defies belief, and it's strong enough to create this blinding effect if you look right at the sun. At day, the city has a very white gleam. It seems surprisingly bright, but I like it more than night, mainly because it brings out the detail on the city. Web of Shadows had conditioned me to just not care about the details. The lighting, building textures, and skyboxes did everything for me there, but here I can't get enough of how real the city feels, like a place, not just a stage. Looking down on the city from one of the game's tallest buildings is an experience you truly cannot get anywhere else. What really put a smile on my face though is that you can see into rooms as if they're not textures, but 3D spaces. Many a room has the exact same layout, which is pretty easy to notice after paying attention for 10 seconds, and some rooms defy the laws of physics, but we got what we came for. There's also a slight problem, which I assume is due to hardware, with the reflections. I particularly like the side mission where you'd crawl along the outside of windows, trailing a guy inside who'd then run through his evil plan which you could snack pictures of, and that the game's camera changes perspective perfectly when you enter stores, so that you have the same level of combat awareness when fighting in these enclosed spaces. I'm running out of structure here, so I'll just say that the water graphics are surprisingly great and I like the pigeons too. But New York is more than just skin deep. I'd like to talk about the music for a minute, because you're going to be hearing it at any time you move, any time you even flex a muscle. The music in this game is something that's been universally praised. Now, this is going to be really unpopular, but I'm not too hot on it. 
I do like the main theme, that was great, and I love the Sinister Six battle theme, but everything else I didn't enjoy. It was extremely generic. So is the main theme, but it's not bland. If you listen to the puzzle section theme, it's just the smart people doing smart things tune you've heard a thousand times before, and that's the only other track I could even remember. I do remember not liking the combat theme, because not only could I barely hear it, it simply sounded boring. The soundtrack for this game seemed to go for the you're not supposed to hear the music, it's simply supposed to be a part of the scene and not draw attention to itself thing that some composers do. I'm not a fan. This is supposed to be an epic Spider-Man story, yet the most epic tune in the game is among the two epic tunes in the game, and it's repeated about three trillion times because it starts every time you even twitch. Seriously, it's hilarious how you can mess around with the game's music system to get it to start blaring the horns because you hopped four foot into the air. Generally though, it does match your flamboyant swinging very well. It makes you feel like a superhero, doing something worthy of an orchestra narrating your movements. Music's only one of the many things you'll be listening to while tumbling through the streets. You're going to spend plenty of your time going from A to B in this game. GTA spices that up with car conversations. This game goes for radio calls. You'll be calling Yuri most of the time, but there's also Miles, MJ, Otto, and May. If not them, it's J. Jonah Jameson's Just The Facts show. I do love that JJJ was included in the game, mostly just for the way that they did it. The usual reason for his absence is simply that there's no Peter Parker sections, or that Peter isn't working as a journalist at the time. But Insomniac got around this by giving him a radio show. JJJ takes the persona of an extremely paranoid but also very arrogant, shouty conspiracy theorist. Um, I don't know if it's just because of the times, but this seems like an Alex Jones parody to me. No idea if it's intentional or not, it might just be a parody of the arrogant, paranoid show host archetype. Either way, it fits JJJ's personality very well, and he's voiced excellently by Duran DePaul, who, if anyone cares, also voiced Reinhardt. Generally, these podcasts were fun to listen to while swinging, but I do take issue with the fact that they stick to a formula every time. Jameson opens opens up with a description of one of Spider-Man's recent deeds and then goes on to tell you that you're wrong if you think he did a good thing. He'll then go on to perform some gold medal worthy mental gymnastics to explain why it's actually a bad thing and that Spider-Man's a menace. Then he'll take a listener's call, the listener will disagree with Jameson and he'll call them a dumbass before abruptly ending the call and the show. The only deviations from this strict formula are usually sprinklings of arrogance, such as Jameson telling everyone that the only way to stay safe is by listening to him all the time, plugging his book, but no personalised signings, and that he's an experienced journalist veteran, so people who disagree with him are unqualified idiots. I did enjoy the title of one of his works, Spider-Man, Threat or Menace. It made me chuckle. But overall, it feels like the scripts for the Jameson episodes were written in a day by people who don't know much about comedy. It's a one-trick pony in my eyes, but the following episodes were never unentertaining. I also have to commend how many episodes there are. There's loads. I'm still hearing them now, well into the endgame. Really good stuff. In Arkham, you'd have heard the same announcement about 50,000 times by now. I think we've spent enough time talking about how pretty New York is. We're here to be Spider-Man. We're here to spend an unhealthy amount of time barreling through the air and littering the streets with webs. The traversal is similar in Golds to Web of Shadows, in that it wants to be extremely accessible but still retain a high skill ceiling. So anyone can go in and swing no problem, but also become extremely skilled with the system, such that they're far quicker and more efficient. Does it achieve that? Let's find out. The basic swinging is as refined as we all hoped. Webs attached to buildings, I've never cared much for that, but if it creates even more immersion for some people, then that's all that matters. The sensation of swinging is greatly enhanced by the graphics, of course, but also the incredible animation quality. The one-handed twist was a favourite of mine. It goes for the most spectacular animations it can, where Web of Shadows went for beauty through simplicity. You can also mix up swinging with tricks. I thought the somersault looked good when you're high up and the cannonball looked good when you're falling, but the others just look a bit silly. I didn't really enjoy any of them. There's no fine control, it's just one of these four animations, and they're all you get. Still, I think a lot of people enjoyed doing them far more than I did. And they're certainly not doing any harm, so I congratulate the inclusion all the same. If I had a complaint with the swinging animations, it would be that there's no good animation for quick changes of direction. It just sort of happens. That doesn't feel very good at all. When you start swinging, you'll have a pretty low speed, but it's very easy to get a feel for the rigid momentum system. By pressing X, you'll boost off the line, and that's the easiest way to raise your momentum. Boosting at a half arc gets you speed 
speed, boosting at a high point in the arc gets you altitude. Pretty obvious, really. I very much enjoy boosting. It feels great, the animation's beautiful, and it retroactively allows you the option to swing without significantly raising your momentum, by simply not boosting. This fine control over speed is something that's hard to figure out, but is clear to the player from the get-go, and I suppose that's all that matters. Another way to raise momentum is with the dive, a more than welcome addition that functions exactly as it did in Batman Arkham. The longer and lower you dive, the more momentum you'll gain on the next swing. This is half worth it for the boost of speed you get at the end, and half worth it for the spectacle of diving off the game's tallest buildings. You can work dives into all aspects of your traversal. Going over buildings, for example, allows you a short window to dive and get more momentum on the swing through the streets. With the dive system, you can gain forward speed whether you're going in a relatively level sequence of swings or up and down like a sine wave. That's fun, and pretty much the only time the game offers more freedom than its predecessors. The only problem I have with the system is that sometimes, even after a massive dive, the payoff is just weak. I don't get why this happens. At max momentum, your DualShock 4 will rumble, simulating the air whipping past Spider-Man. This is absolutely amazing, yet another way the game sells its sense of speed. But even after long dives, you might not get the max momentum swing. It seems amazingly inconsistent to me. It might just have something to do with the fact that the game will not let you touch the ground while swinging. It just won't happen. Even if it means having Spider-Man fly above the ground before the web is even attached to anything as if he's wearing hover boots. It looks wrong, detriments the immersion, and doesn't make any sense. Suspension of disbelief will only carry you so far. What would have been wrong with having Spider-Man run along the ground if the bottom of the arc intersects the ground, like in Web of Shadows? Surely that could work better than ever in a game with a parkour system as good as this. Maybe it's a lot to ask, but I think it should have been better than hover boots. And if the hover boots problem affects momentum off a swing that would have intersected the ground, then that might partly explain the dive issue. More likely, it's simply a flaw of the momentum system. Personally, I think the fastest Spider-Man could ever go should be off these dives, but this isn't the case in the game, even when it does work, and you were never to intersect the ground. On a much more positive note, the web running. I've got problems with it, and we'll get onto that in a minute, but for now, I just want to appreciate how fluid, fast, and fun the web running is. It only takes holding R2 next to a wall to begin a web run, and the speed is fantastic. Fantastic. The web run in this game handles signposts and fire escapes with a cool little animation. Well, it doesn't work all the time, but I hope that will be addressed in a patch. Speaking of fire escapes, you can also web run straight up them, which is a great detail. Off a web run, the jump is somehow more satisfying than the one from Web of Shadows, and all of that keeps your momentum high. Switching between rows of buildings to run along has never felt better. Not quite so much for web zipping. From the ground, you'll have to jump to begin swinging. This looks a lot better when you have the charge jump. You can't just start from the ground, and it's not like Web of Shadows where you'd first begin with a big web zip to get you into it. You can't web zip from the ground with the X button, however you can zip to a perch, and from that, point launch up to speed which is arguably even cooler than the way Web of Shadows did it. Sometimes you can zip into specific objects instead of onto them, and that gets you a web tunnel animation. Because the web tunnel only handles a set direction, you really need to be approaching from that direction. If not, your momentum just shifts all of a sudden, which looks completely off. This means, despite how cool they are, you're really going to make them flow well, but I still love the fact that you can do them anyway. Like Arkham, there's a marker over perches you can zip to, which is a perfect way of being able to make pinpoint landings without having to slow down. Well, as long as that pinpoint is a very obvious perch point, and it probably always will be, because you can point launch from any perch, and you're more than likely going to want it to be from a clear location like a water tower or a ledge. It works. In practice, the point launch is a safety net. No matter how bollocks the situation you find yourself in, you're more than likely going to be able to zip to a nearby perch, point launch, and keep the speed going. By bollocks situation, I'm referring to when you're about to meet a building and you need to get over, but you don't have the altitude. Any situation in which you'd find yourself smacking into a wall in Spider-Man 2 or Web of Shadows, essentially. So it's accessible, but does it have a level of skill? Only insofar as pressing X at the right time. There's a strict timing window, but the best time within that gets you this huge boost that blows dust away. Mechanically, it's sound. I certainly think it reduces the skill level needed to traverse the city competence. It's just that easy to use, but it makes up for it in fun factor. The zip to perch doesn't replace the web zip though. That's still here. It's X to shoot forward. You can do that twice without losing altitude. Sometimes Spider-Man will do a cool two-handed zip rather than a one-handed zip, and I thought that this looks much cooler. Even now, I can't figure out why or when it happens. I'm pretty sure you can't control it, which is a shame. The only other problem I have with the zips is that they somehow cancel out downward momentum. This looks completely wrong, especially considering how relatively weak the zip itself looks. Maybe if it was a hard yank, I'd buy it, but it's not. The zip does redeem itself with its over-the-roof thing. When you're web running up a building, you can press X at the right time before you get to the ledge, and that'll put you into this cool 
little zip animation that chucks you right over. In Web of Shadows, which I believe is the only Spider-Man game that allows you to passively throw yourself up over the roof of a building, you could immediately zip and do the same thing manually. But Spider-Man PS4 solution is a much easier and more elegantly animated way of doing it, at the cost of reducing the skill ceiling somewhat, probably in the name of accessibility. This game focuses greatly on the accessibility of the experience. So much so that by simply holding R2 and nothing else, you can perform extended sequences of swings complete with jumps and dives. The game pretty much goes on autopilot if you want it to. R2 is also the button you need to be holding for the parkour in the game, which by the way is absolutely incredible if a little buggy. Spider-Man will jump freely over obstacles with ease, and that includes going from building to building. There's also the little web zip thing he does to get over roofs, and web running which I believe is counted as parkour too. Everything they did here is amazing, it all flows and connects perfectly so that no matter the surface, Spider-Man can traverse it in spectacular fashion. My problem though is R2. R2 is swinging, and as I said, holding it basically puts the game on autopilot. But you need to be holding R2 if you want the parkour, and you do want the parkour because without it you'll come to a screeching halt any time you make surface contact. You might also be holding R2 because you hit it before there was a swing point. So the end result is basically never letting go of R2 because you know it'll probably disadvantage you, and thus feeling as if you're not really playing the game. For me, this issue presented itself in a pretty major fashion. I would hold R2 and never let go because you can press the X button to jump off your line without having to release it. There was literally no practical reason to let go. The problem with this is that the game would automatically go into dive states and begin swings as soon as it found a viable swing point. So was I actually playing the game, or was I just periodically pressing X and watching, bewitched with the visuals? What you need to understand is that when you're not in this R2 fugue state, you can pick when to begin the next swing, which allows for far more control over altitude, distance, speed, destination, everything. Unless you're falling a great distance, the game will not automatically begin dives if you aren't holding R2. You begin them with R3. Non-natural dives and automatic swings aren't satisfying because they're being done by the game and not by your specific input. Thankfully, as soon as you realise you're in it, it's just as easy to get out. But it affected me multiple times, and is symptomatic of the overall problem with the traversal. A relative lack of freedom. Now before anyone launches their cruise missiles, focus on the keyword relative. It's still a very free movement system, but compared to other iterations, I found myself more restricted than I'd like to be. My biggest problem is that the game automatically breaks your line even if you're holding R2. Sometimes I believe this is caused by the line having to wrap around the building to continue, which Insomniac decided wasn't going to be allowed. A, I really don't think it's better to not have lines clip through buildings than it is to have freedom, and B, this isn't even close to consistent. Most of the time the line will just arbitrarily break and it does clip through anything and everything whenever it feels like it. Considering this, I think the primary reason for it is probably because the game wants that autopilot feature I described earlier. You can no longer circle buildings to get a fashionable redirect. You can no longer do loop-de-loops, get higher or meet the roof properly. And because it's so wildly inconsistent, you can't gauge when the line's gonna break, which makes accurate movement without the zip to perch far more difficult than it should be. For example, if I want to fly up a building, instead of running, I might reach the top of my swinging arc so I'm going parallel to the building. If I boost off at the right moment, I can soar up the building, maybe straight over it. Does this happen in Spider-Man PS4? No, the line breaks before you're parallel, and the upwards boost will often just clip you into the building. That's real stylish. Sometimes the game will let you stay on your line for a nice swing around the building. Sometimes it'll break well before you can pull it off. I sure as hell can't find any consistency to it, but I don't think it should exist in the first place. As it stands, the correct way to scale buildings is to web run. Now, you can web zip while we're running, which is a great inclusion, but man is it weak. This is just a little hop. It's hard to tell if you're even going any faster by doing this. You are, but it doesn't feel like a boost. You were once able to do this. You can even do it horizontally as well. You are also able to run down a building, but here this is impossible. Even if I want to angle my running direction slightly downward, I can't. I honestly don't know why. It makes for unnecessary frustration, especially in those drone challenges. These are things that I believe are less free than previous iterations, but what about things it doesn't do at all? There is no way to consistently begin wall crawling upon touching a building. The way Spider-Man wraps around objects is also worse than it was in Web of Shadows because it's just an automatic animation. You also cannot zip from a wall crawl, and Spider-Man can't get over random arbitrary obstacles. There is no line climbing if you want to quickly gain height, there is no rapid upward zip, there is no swing boosting, though that might be seen as a good thing. There is no pole swinging, no wall bouncing, no wall latching, and no wall latch jumping. There's no web slingshot, though that's not a big deal. Still, these things combined with the relatively restrictive features the game does have create an occasionally on rails sensation, one I did not enjoy at all. However, this sensation is, as I said previously, one you can free yourself from fairly easily. 
properly, at least for the duration of the game. And when you're in the flow of what the game does get right, the perfect feelings of speed and the beautiful connections from one surface to another, Spider-Man PS4 is without a doubt the best web swinging experience we've had so far. So, was it successful at creating an accessible system with a high skill ceiling? Not as much as I'd like. It's beyond accessible, but it sacrifices a lot with regards to depth and skill potential. This doesn't change the refinement of the mechanics though, and that is where Insomniac hits a perfect 10. Overall then, we've got a spectacular system, marred only by sacrifices of depth. When it works for you, I'd say it's easily the best iteration of swinging we've ever had. Which means it's probably among, if not the best, city traversal system in games as a whole. With regards to comparison, we're in a difficult place. Because not everyone values sensation over depth. The place I'm at with Spider-Man PS4 is coming online for an hour, spending the first 15 minutes enthralled, and then the next 45 slowly getting bored. After a while, I've done everything the system physically allows you to do 10 times over. This takes so much longer in Spider-Man 2 because of how long it takes to master, and in Web of Shadows because of how much more you can do. So because of this, those games might sit undefeated for many people. But for the average player now, I think it's appropriately a marvel. Time will tell if it's a system I go back to as regularly as the others over the years, but based on it alone, I recommend the game to Spider-Man fans. But hey, what's the point in swinging about if there aren't any criminals to not murder? Any good open world Spider-Man game needs random crimes. They offer immersion, important pacing by padding the story, and most importantly, replay value. They are absolutely vital to the experience, and Insomniac clearly knew that because this is easily the best realisation of random crimes we've ever had. It's not my favourite, but it is in my opinion the best. It works as you'd expect, you swing through the city and crimes will just appear. You'll hear a voice over the radio talking about a situation and then you hit R3 for the location. Crimes early on are very basic, just thugs robbing stores, beating someone up or dealing drugs. These are dealt with exactly as you'd expect. The car chases though are a lot more interesting, and grab a bite to eat because I've got a lot to to say on them. This isn't like Web of Shadows where instead of stopping the vehicle and apprehending the suspects, you just brutally murder them, destroy the vehicle, and kill a few pedestrians for good measure. Insomniac Spider-Man is a little more focused on safety. Actually catching up to the car is just a matter of pressing triangle after a 10 second interval, which is really disappointing to be honest. It's not a car chase, it's a car triangle press and then a car dance about on the roof. As for the actual apprehension, whenever a guy sticks his head out, you push the stick in that direction and press square. You do that however many times it takes. If you're too slow, you get shot and go through the horrific punishment of having to press triangle again. When you take out the last guy, you'll get this badass animation and then have prompt to spam square. If you spam it hard enough, it's considered a safe stop, and you get more XP. If not, you'll take a little damage. Early on in my spectacular playthrough, I found the safe stop was pretty hard to pull off, and that's good. It gave a little extra challenge and reward to the car chases. But overall, these gravely disappointed me. They look awesome, but they're no more dynamic than a railroad. You get no choice in how to stop the car whatsoever, no agency at all. It's little more than a very good looking QTE. I didn't think I'd be comparing this game to The Amazing Spider-Man of all things, but I actually really enjoyed the first one, and I think the Oscorp robots were a blast to fight against. What I liked most of all though was that these Seeker robots you'd fight were relatively dynamic engagements. You actually did have to chase them and you'd get one hell of a fireworks show as you went along. You'd have to get out of the way of these blue balls of death and then get close to web strike. Applying that to cars, maybe we're not going as fast or as pretty as that, but we sure as hell can go as dynamic. Cars should be able to fight back as Spider-Man chases them, attacks beyond the odd gunshot to dodge. You might need to dodge more rapidly to avoid the constant fire Spider-Man receives as you get closer. There needs to be an actual chase, not just a button press. So the range at which you hit triangle should be far smaller. As for the apprehension, we've got plenty of gadgets. Web up the wheels, jam them with an environmental object, break the engine. Why not take the doors off as you can with stationary cars to get an opportunity to web strike the occupant, then up the ante a little, introduce more than one car. There's plenty of potential for the system, but no matter how or if they improve it, as it stands the chases are woefully shallow. At most you'll get two cars at a time later in the game, but you either don't fight both or there'll be one car that literally requires one button to stop. That's not a joke. One button. It's the same one hit a quitter deal for Sable APCs. These will often call in for reinforcements in the form of another turreted APC and about four gunmen. I think they're probably the hardest random crime in the game, but that's mostly because the game lets you tear off the turret on top at its own discretion. You'll get the prompt whenever, so in many a fight I just end up walking around in front of the APC like a complete plum while four gunmen line up their shots. 
This needs polishing and an update. Other Sable random crimes include these big jetpack guys who are the only airborne enemies in the game. That makes for some good combat variation, because you have very little reason to ever touch the ground. Demons and escaped prisoners will also get up to various kinds of no good, such as aiming snipers, capturing bases, and occupying rooftops. The only other kinds include civilian rescue after a hit and run, which just involves pulling some boxes away from a door and sometimes a very cool QTE, kidnapping, which just involves following a tracker, rescuing a trapped civilian, and then beating up some goons. Break-ins that have all the thugs run away as soon as they see you, forcing an extended chase to catch them all. This is really fun when the AI isn't stumped by a fence or a gate, and you don't cheese it with insta-kill gadgets. There's also the bomb truck thing, which is just a pretty car chase that has you chuck the bomb away at the end. And finally, bomb job. A bunch of bombs are planted on apartments, and you have to take out the snipers, as well as defuse bombs with this minigame. I don't like these minigames, but doing them in a random crime was welcome immersion. A very cool detail would be that in muggings, the last guy standing will sometimes rush over to the victim and put a gun to their head. It's up to you to do this QTE to save them. A really immersive touch. Mainly because it's completely unexpected. These unexpected twists on the usual beat up the bad guy crimes are by far the best things the system has to offer. I wish there were more details like this to punctuate your 50 trillionth car chase or bus occupation. More and more crime types will pop up as the game continues, so active crimes rarely grow stale for at least the duration of the game. Which is what matters the most. I don't like the car chases, and I think a lot more could have been done with them. There's a huge amount of potential for random events, as The Amazing Spider-Man showed. But generally, this game only ever spices up its basic formula of having a small group of bad guys to fight out in the city. If The Amazing Spider-Man can pull off drone chases a console generation ago, this game can too. There's already a helicopter chase in the game. There's already a subway system. Even if it's not a big blockbuster chase, we've already had a side mission where we had to tail a train underground. Maybe we've got to stay in range to defuse a bomb. Please don't hesitate to post any of your own ideas in the comments. Even with the variation we have, which is more than satisfactory, the system as it stands is still fantastic. It's certainly deeper than anything from Spider-Man 2 or Ultimate, and had yet more variation than even Web of Shadows. That's impressive, because Web of Shadows relied on that solely to keep the player occupied outside of the story. But this game has far more than just crimes in its city. Aside from the main missions, we've got backpacks, black cat stakeouts, pigeons, taskmaster challenges, hideouts, research stations, landmarks, and side missions. Many of these are nothing more than vapid collectibles. Backpacks are just press triangle to get some fan service. Pigeons, yes, pigeons, are for Howard as a side mission. Stakeouts are just taking a picture of a toy cat, and landmarks are just press up on the D-pad to equip the camera and grab a shot of the building. These are distractions for obsessives, and devoid of anything more. You'll never go to a backpack and realise it's been stolen and then have to find it. You'll never do anything with the items inside except look at them. You might argue that these are the equivalent of the spiders from Web of Shadows, or the comic books from The Amazing Spider-Man, but this is not so. Spiders were placed so you collected them passively while becoming more experienced with the movement system. System, and comics in the same way required control over the movement system to collect. Backpacks are not movement-based collectibles. They're often tucked away, so you'll have to slow down to get them. Landmarks are about as boring as collectibles get. They only result in a picture, and I don't think anyone was playing the game for New York holiday photos, especially since this is probably the 80 millionth open world New York we've played in. Thankfully though, snapping the pictures can be done on the move. You never need to come to a halt, so they're never tedious to collect. Not so for stakeouts. You're going to have to stop, start the challenge, look about until your controller shakes, zoom in on the cat, and then take a picture. You get some dialogue each time and a suit for completing them all. It also ties into the first DLC, but either way, these are about as bad as open world collectibles get. Pigeons require you to chase them for a while, so that's something more than the others, but then it's just a matter of pressing L1 and R1. You never need to touch the actual pigeon, which would have been a much more interesting traversal challenge. Four open world activities, all of which are essentially collectibles with the depth of a puddle, and only one of which ever makes use of the movement or the combat. Despite how boring they are, I don't mind them because they aren't the only side stuff the game has to offer. They aren't hurting anyone. They can give you something to occasionally distract yourself with to pad out the rest of the city. Side activities with actual depth include research stations, taskmaster challenges, and side missions. Hideouts are the best of the lot, but they're not what I'd call deep. It's just wave-based combat in a pre-made arena. You get to take out a few guards from stealth, and the arenas are always populated by loads of environmental objects to spice up the combat a little. I also thought that six waves was perfect balancing to beat the hideout. They're all very fun. Research stations are little Oscorp labs left around the city. Harry has a bunch of tasks for you to fulfill while he's away, and it'll always give you a little backstory whenever you enter one. It's odd though, because Harry's explanations, like Jameson's radio show, seem to stick to a formula. Harry says that this station is about measuring toxins or pressure or something, then he goes on about how much his mum wanted the work completed. 
And then maybe he'll add that you've got to save the station from being shut down by Oscorp, a lazy and completely ineffective way of introducing stakes. Thankfully though, the actual content is pretty entertaining. There's a lot of variation. One time you'll be ground pounding the roads to relieve pressure in the system. The next time you'll be swinging through clouds of noxious gas and taking pictures of the responsible cars. They're far from challenging, but at least they've got a slight narrative element and have you controlling something that isn't a camera pitch. Taskmaster challenges are much better. About halfway through the game, you'll be introduced to these challenges Mr. T set up around the city. And the more you progress, the more challenges you'll unlock. There are four types. Chase a drone, dispose of bombs, clear a stealth arena as quickly as possible, and combat. Drones reward accuracy of movement, bombs reward pure speed, stealth is rapid execution, and combat is of course combat prowess. There's three levels of completion. Amazing, spectacular, and ultimate. And good god, ultimate can be difficult to achieve sometimes. This is fantastic. I love grinding away a challenge, getting better and better as I play, like going for the platinum medal in the first prototype. The only issue I'd raise with these challenges is that the combat ones don't always seem fairly scored. The combat's great, but the scoring rewards time to finish, and if you're going for time above all, you should just spam out your insta-kill gadgets and then abuse web shooters to stick everyone to walls, which is by far the quickest and safest way of dealing with any encounter in the game. Problem is, it's boring. The combat is at its best when you're flowing from one cool attack into another, not spamming the same move over and over. This is entirely a fault of the combat, but you'd expect the challenges to account for it. In Arkham, they either rewarded style and mixing it up, or simply how long you could live for. This is where Spider-Man could really stand to improve. After you've finished a certain number of challenges, you'll be ambushed by Taskmaster and get a small boss fight. Same thing will happen after you finish them all, which is a great incentive to get through them. These challenges provide the kind of side stuff people really want from Spider-Man games. Races time trials, the opportunity to really master a specific route. And they provide that, but honestly, I'd have liked quite a few more. There's a total of four challenges of each type. That's all you get. Four time trial races in a Spider-Man game is quite clearly lacking, and I'd have enjoyed significantly more, especially given how otherwise not very good the side stuff is. A fourth level of mastery over the challenges once you get ultimate in all of them would be great for endgame players too. And that leaves us with side missions. Some of these are great, some of them aren't. One of them is find 12 pigeons as we've already covered, but in the same boat there's a boss fight with Tombstone. Generally they're much more in the middle. A distressed character is met, a situation is described, Spider-Man goes off to deal with said situation, maybe there's a twist or a high intensity moment, maybe not, and then you're done. These last no more than 10 minutes. Dealing with the situation might be fighting a bunch of goons from rooftop to rooftop, or it might be tracking a criminal organization and photographing their plans. The premise might be finding a fake Spider-Man, or it might just be a bunch of bad guys doing bad guys stuff. A high intensity moment might be the person who gave you the side mission being attacked, and you having to rush over there, or a boss fight. But sometimes, there won't be anything. It completely varies in quality, but the average really isn't all that high. Fighting demons who are doing demon stuff is something you can do anywhere else. Main story, challenges, random crimes. It's just not a fun premise for side missions. And there's rarely anything memorable, only one special fight, no major rewards, and no particularly interesting characters or set pieces. They very much seemed like an afterthought. So much so that I feel the title, Side Mission, is Insomniac's biggest error. This means they have to hold up to other games' side missions, and these don't. They're too short, and 9 times out of 10 follow the same formula. These are more like distressed citizen events. So that's just about everything to do in the city. Good enemy bases, fun challenges of which there aren't enough, mildly entertaining research stations, and mediocre side missions, padded out by four bland collectathons. It's not exactly a good show. And what do you get for your time? Tokens. This intrinsically ties progression outside of the skill tree to the side content, because everything costs tokens. Backpacks award backpack tokens, and it's the same for crimes, taskmaster challenges, landmarks, bases, and research stations. Each suit, suit mod, and gadget upgrade will cost a various amount of tokens. And that's essentially your motivation to do the side stuff. Gadget upgrades make the game easier, simple as that. I've got plenty to say on gadgets, you just wait. But suit mods are a lot more interesting, and in that you've only got three slots, but every suit mod is extremely useful, so you can really change your play based on what you equip. It would have been nice to see more interesting individual mods, but the benefits of a Deus Ex-like upgrade system is here. Though you want to have everything, you can only have three. The other thing you'll be spending tokens on is suits. This is a lot more exciting. The suit selection in Spider-Man PS4 is pretty impressive. You could say it's the game's strong suit. You'll unlock the ability to unlock them with level, so they're paced out. The biggest plus isn't the selection, it's that you don't have to wait when switching. 
It's instant. I don't know what black magic they used to pull that off, but man, it's great to be able to switch without sitting through a loading screen or going to a location. Every suit model is fantastically detailed. It's really an impressive feat, especially when you see your selected suit in some of the game's most explosive cutscenes. They even go so far as to have your suit appear in loading. Appearance isn't the only thing they bring to the table, though. There's also suit powers. These are suit-specific buffs you get by pressing the sticks at the same time. This stops there from being any gameplay motivation to use different suits, but I prefer never feeling pressured into swapping. The powers themselves are largely unimpressive. A shockwave, more focus gain, harder hitting attacks. The best of them are the Iron Arms, which I was very happy to see on the Iron Spider suit, the Scarlet Spider's holograms and the 2099's low gravity, which isn't particularly useful, but fun nonetheless. Other notable powers would be the Noir's ability to stop enemies from calling for reinforcements, complemented by this awesome black and white filter, and the comic suit's ability to call the enemy mean names. All the powers are fun, some let you make the game much easier, and some are just a laugh. If you are going to use the gameplay affecting ones, though, they're not what I'd call balanced. I mean, why use a crappy shockwave when you could have quad damage? just doesn't make much sense. The choice of suits themselves are another issue I have. I'm confused as how we managed to get Spirit Spider, but not the Raimi suit. Or three Spider Armor variants, but not the first one. I mean, what do you get when you type in Spider Armor on Google? The original one. There are also no Symbiote suits, no Raimi black suit, not even a comic black suit. According to Brian Interhar, this is because they wanted to do it justice with an insomniac story. Sounds cool, huh? But I also don't think you should sacrifice suit choice for a tiny bit of story continuity. Would anyone care if you could play with a symbiote suit before the in-game universe introduced symbiotes? And if the Venom symbiote will play a major role in the next game, which it very well might, then if not the classic black suit, why not the Raimi black suit? It's just a look, you don't need to have a symbiote suit power. I was also let down by the lack of an original Iron Spider suit. The Infinity War one looks great, but it's nothing like the original. Hopefully this stuff will come with DLC. In conclusion, the side stuff is passable. The rewards fare well, but the actual side content is largely uninspired or tedious. What it does get right it owes entirely to its good traversal and combat, which is exactly what we're going to look at next. Combat in this game is a surprise. One of the trailers had me thinking it'd be a lot better than it is, but most of the pre-release stuff set my expectations far too low. Was this going to be an Arkham clone? Was it going to beat Web of Shadows? Well, straight off the bat, while Web of Shadows has the closest combat system in terms of quality, they couldn't be more different with regards to style, scale, and freedom. This is far closer to the amazing Spider-Man, small scale and Arkham-like. But while there it was very clearly an Arkham adaptation, this is not. This has all the design goals of Arkham, but with Spider-Man in mind from inception. It's got the same lock-on combat, but doesn't free flow in the same way. And it's a dodge instead of a counter. As usual, Spider-Man is directed within the group with the left stick and can switch targets mid-combo, but you probably won't be doing that. The basic punches feel pretty weak outside of perfect hits, and I think they're supposed to. You're not really supposed to be doing your best damage with the frontal blows, and there's never a state in which you can repeatedly knock enemies to the ground with a single punch like in Arkham. If you throw a punch, then immediately dodge in the same direction, you'll slide under the enemy's legs, and if you follow that with another two punches, you'll kick them far away, often into other enemies. This is a much better source of damage, especially with the potential to knock them straight off buildings. And downed enemies are also prone to being finished with webs. If an enemy is near a wall, ceiling, or floor, webbing them up will take them out of the fight. This gets a lot deeper though, because a webbed enemy who isn't near an object to be stuck to can be chucked into one. If you hold triangle on a webbed enemy, you'll spin them around, and if you chuck them at a wall, they're out for good. However, if you're close punch, and then hold triangle, you'll grab them and chuck them right into another enemy or wall, which is much quicker than the spin, although lacks crowd control potential. Note that holding triangle will not spin a non-webbed enemy, but it will throw a non-webbed enemy if you're close enough. If you web an enemy who's in the air, you can yank them back down, which sticks them to the floor. You can do the same from the air. The webs synergize with practically everything else you can do. On top of the synergy granted by the fact that most of your attacks can hit enemies into other enemies, the synergy from the webs gives a fair amount of depth to the combat, far more so than I expected. You use your limited web shooter supply on troublesome enemies and get an opportunity to use them as weapons for crowd control, or to get them out of the way as soon as possible. I like it. To get enemies into the air, the air launch is your go-to move. It's just a simple holding of the square button. A launched enemy can 
be further engaged by simply pressing square, you'll join them in the air and begin an air combo. Up here you'll have many opportunities. If you hold square again, you'll swing kick, which A looks very cool, and B allows you to kick enemies right off buildings. So knowing this, it's always best to try and use the swing kick on enemies near ledges. If there's no opportunity for that, you can keep the combo going as long as you like with the web strike and continuing combos. You can even use them as a weapon from up here with a yank. Jumping off them is something you can do, and if you aim it right, it's basically the same thing as the swing kick, but quicker and with more range. Why swing kick then? We'll see. Later in the game, you'll get the ground pound. Air combat will now let you transition into a ground pound, which is a source of crowd control. This gives the air launch slightly more utility because now an airborne enemy provides an opportunity for an AoE attack as well as single target. But the air launch is not the only way to start air attacks. You can just jump off enemies, which gets you into the air for a swing kick and ground pound. So the air launch does not have the exclusive utility of flowing into swing kicks or ground pounds. However, the player might not be aware of the jump off option, which the game tutorializes with an easily forgettable and missable tactic. Xbox. The higher up your ground pound, the bigger the effect, so for maximum damage, you charge launch into the sky and come down with a pound that knocks enemies on their asses. From air launch height though, it's just a stagger, far from effective crowd control. It does give the charge jump a combat utility though, and that I love. The web strike is back for Spider-Man PS4, and it actually serves the same function here as it did in Web of Shadows. It's a connector. It's an attack that lets you transition from one enemy or one group of enemies to another. It's not like Arkham where you're a bitch seeking missile. You need the web strike if you're out of range. It's an easy transition from air to ground, and it allows you to keep wailing on the same guy over and over. No mercy. Through simplicity alone, it couldn't serve its function as an attack that keeps the flow of combat high at all times any better. A perfect implementation if there ever was one. As the game progresses, fights get real hectic. Enemies with whips, swords, shields, AoE, machine guns. Amazingly similar enemies to Arkham. You're going to be dodging like there's no tomorrow, and that's why I like the perfect dodge so much. If you dodge at the right time, Spider-Man will shoot a web into the enemy's face. This is extremely useful. It rewards perfect timing with silencing threats. If you perfect dodge a projectile weapon, you'll get an upgrade later on that allows you to insta-kill with a web strike. And there's also a suit mod that'll slow down time after a perfect dodge, which makes it even more powerful. I'd say it's the one crutch players have late game when enemies get overwhelming. It allows you to skill your way past extreme threats with good timing. And for such a simple addition, it deserves great praise. What I don't like, though, is that it's an upgrade. This isn't a problem with the timing, you get the perfect dodge extremely early. But it sets the precedent for locking very important moves behind the skill tree. Look at the Bunker Buster, the one where swing kicks go through shields. This gives the swing kick a reason to exist. Near ledges, it's outclassed by the jump off. You might still do it because it looks cool, but it's not mechanically encouraged. The Bunker Buster upgrade makes you more powerful, but giving a move a reason to exist shouldn't be an upgrade. Wait, hang on a minute. What about the yank that removes enemies' shields completely, and then smacks them over the head with it? The swing kick just can't catch a break. Its only practical application is looking cool as soon as you get the shield yank. All moves should have a reason to exist in combat, a perfect time to use. Mixing up attacks looks awesome. It's why the combat feels so good. So surely that should be encouraged mechanically. The game does all right with encouraging attack diversity. It doesn't want you hitting enemies from the front too much, simply because of how much damage you can do with literally anything else. Despite how many things you can do in the air, its main use is removing a single enemy from the group and beating the crap out of him. Problem is, if I wanted single target, I'd just knock him on his ass with anything else and web him down. It's also worth noting that a ground pound that isn't activated from a charge jump is completely outclassed by the crowd control potential you can get from the gadgets, yank spin on webbed enemies, or environmental objects. So what is the actual point in air combat that isn't near ledges mechanically? Not much. The game does force you to air launch on enemies with batons, but the yank once again takes much of that away, and there's no guarantee that you'll follow an air launch with air attacks. You might go onto another enemy. Point is, this is a game with about a hundred ways to deal damage to enemies. Every face button is capable of being an offensive option in pretty much every location. Yet, outside of visual flair, there's not enough done to encourage attack mixing. The reason you do it is because it looks and feels so good, not because it's the best or even a very good way of doing things. Really, the skill potential comes from timing dodges, focus trade-offs, and positioning. Dodges is self-explanatory, but focus and positioning are not something that I expected. Spider-Man is squishy in this game, especially on spectacular difficulty, which I recommend for people who are fairly experienced with combat systems like this. 
you've really got to be paying attention to that spider sense effect. But there is always a way to come back from a bad start, and that is focus. You press down on the d-pad to convert your focus to health. How much you get depending on how much you sacrifice, and if you have the suit mod that improves focus health gain. But focus is also the way you access these beautifully animated finishes. So you have to make a trade-off, you need to be monitoring the enemies as well as your own health bar. An enjoyable mechanic, one very necessary to a game where Spider-Man could get killed so easily. It's good that you can come back from an encounter where you can get stun locked into 5 hits. As for positioning, I'm sure leading enemies towards ledges and chucking them off is obvious, but there's also leading enemies near surfaces like trees, cars and walls, also you get an opportunity for an easy web takedown. And then there's the environmental objects, you can pick up manhole covers, bins, fire extinguishers, motorcycles, etc, and hurl them around yourself, knocking over anyone in the way. You can continue the dwell for a short period by spamming triangle until you let go and chuck the object into the face of whoever you target. This is excellent crowd control, only at the cost of exposing yourself to damage while you pick the object up. Enemies with guns will still take aim during the swell, so you might have to drop it early. Generally these objects are everywhere, so you don't have to position yourself to find them, but you do have to position yourself so you won't get hit, and will also affect the most number of enemies. Even better, any grenades or missiles the enemy shoots at you can be thrown right back at them Iron Man style. That's a rush every time. Twirly objects aren't the only kind though, there's construction equipment and shelves that you can pull onto enemies, which always results in a one hit KO. This always looks great, especially thanks to how free you are with regards to when you can do them. As long as Spider-Man's webs can reach the object, you can interact with it, ground, air, high or low. If you do use the air version on smaller objects, you'll get a much quicker and safer overhead slam, at the sacrifice of the crowd control from the twirl. The only thing I didn't like was the lack of things to do with environmental objects. You can only twirl stuff like a manhole cover. The problem is, because it's so effective an attack, especially late game when you have the upgrades, if you have multiple enemies around you, you might as well just continue doing it over and over, and then you have the webbed enemies that you can twirl, so you can find yourself in a chain of 3 twirls straight, which just looks ridiculous. I'd have liked more ways to interact with the environmental objects. What about a smash or a baseball swing attack that you can only do with a tap instead of a hold of L1 and R1? Still, they're a completely unexpected and excellent addition nonetheless. People who have already played the game might be surprised that I didn't include any gadgets on the skill potential list, and that's for a reason. I really don't like the gadgets in this game. They don't make the game any worse, but they are poorly implemented in my opinion. The direct comparison here is indeed Arkham, and it's not very flattering. Despite the fact that there are 8 gadgets in the game, there are actually only 3 gadgets in the game. Insta-kills, stuns, and the web shooter. I've already gone over why the web shooter is so good, I have a hard time counting it as a gadget to be honest, and I don't like that you have to swap it out any time you want to use another gadget. Within the categories insta-kills and stuns, there is minor variation. In insta-kills you've got the impact web and the trip mine. These are both very fun to use. I love how ridiculously powerful the impact web is, and how the trip mine will grab two enemies together. What I don't like is that they fulfill the same function, and that function is boring. Impact web is an insta-kill as long as they hit off a ledge or eventually make contact with a surface that isn't the floor, and with only minor positioning that's not hard to do. For the trip mine to insta-kill it just needs the blue line to intersect any surface. It's quite difficult to mess up, although completely inconsistent, because you're probably not going to fine aim it in combat. There's very little difference between the two with regards to practical application, and insta-kill is just a weak function regardless. Regardless. It's just a cheap way of removing challenge from an encounter if I can just chuck out my insta-kill gadgets and walk away. They refill automatically with combat, especially after finishes, so it's not like they're one-time use. The trip mine stealth application sure looked great on the E3 demo, but in practice there is not one time in the entire game where these elaborate traps would be appropriate. You can just put the trip mine under the enemy's bollocks, job done. Now let's move on to the stuns. Web bomb. Stuns a bunch of people, the guy it's stuck to gets webbed. So that's an opportunity, and if there are any enemies in the blast radius near walls, it's an insta-kill. Electric web. Stuns a bunch of people, only ever useful in the story and against one type of enemy late game. Spider drone. Stuns a bunch of people. Suspension matrix. Stuns a bunch of people, but it looks cool. Concussion blast. You guessed it. It knocks a bunch of people on their asses. only difference is that it might allow you to get a few web takedowns on grounded enemies. Oh, and if you're on a ledge, it'll allow you to insta-kill everyone. It's a rush the first time, but otherwise it's just a cheap way to cheese an encounter. You'll get 4 charges if you upgrade it, so you can just cheese an entire sniper active crime. If you get into an encounter and spam out all your gadgets, you'll win with little to no effort, but it'll be the most boring thing in the world. It's like an intentional cheese mechanic, I just don't get it. The spider drone is completely worthless, but the other four at least have occasional utility. Even so, their primary practical function remains the same. 
Stuns for crowd control. No special utility, no reason to use on one specific kind of enemy. Now Arkham was not perfect on this front, but it had the remote electric charge which would overload stun batons. The Batarang would insta-kill charging enemies. The Destructor would take weapons out of play, even allowing for setup. In Spider-Man, you can't even quick-fire gadgets. You instead have to pause the game to get into this weapon wheel, which ruins the speed of an otherwise breakneck fast combat experience. And since the game calls the web shooters a gadget, they're on the wheel too. You're going to want to use the web shooters a lot, so it's hard to justify ever switching them out. It's a double tap of L1 to swap between the last two gadgets you used, and thank god for it. But I only know to do that because I read the tip. How many people won't have done? And it doesn't change the fact that A, if you used two non-web shooter gadgets, you're still going to have to manually select them. And B, there should be quick fires for at least most of them. Button bindings don't have to be a problem. Hold R1 and any of the face buttons for the most important four. If not that, then give the web shooters a separate button so you can have a gadget and the shooters equipped at the same time. Other than the fact that they're all really fun to watch, I'm struggling to find anything good to say about the gadgets. A disappointment. Really, it's the spectacle of combat that sells it more than anything. It's mechanically satisfying. There is a clear difference between a bad player and a good one. There's potential for skill and positioning and timing. But above everything else, the combat's strongest suit is how it looks and feels. Enemies are blown back appropriately. Animations are excellent. Slow-mo from the perfect dodge is beautiful. Many objects are fully destructible and chucking enemies through them is amazingly satisfying. There's nothing like dodging a missile at the last second, grabbing it out of slow-mo and throwing it right back at them. The air attacks, especially the swing kick, all feel great. And I love booting enemies off buildings to watch them get webbed back on at the last second. But there's more to that than meets the eye. With combat that feels good, attack mixing can naturally be encouraged. As I said, you do it because it looks cool. Now, of course, this isn't good enough. Mixing should be encouraged mechanically. But the people who are just here to see Spider-Man beat up the bad guys in the coolest way possible are going to be more than satisfied. I certainly was. The only complaint I have with the presentation is that the colours and effects obscure the spider sense far too often, meaning I can't always tell when to perfect dodge. I've also heard complaints regarding when the spider sense goes off. Sometimes it goes off far too early sometimes far too late. I can attest to it occasionally going off too early, but I never noticed the latter. It was far from an issue for me, but if this is a problem for others, then Insomniac need to fix that quick. Compared to Web of Shadows, Spider-Man PS4 is capable of far more synergy. Every attack works with everything else. There's not much skill required to do well, but the skill ceiling is in geostationary orbit. Yet this game still loses its wow, look how cool that was factor far quicker than Web of Shadows in my opinion. The reason for that is simple. Its animations are far less flashy, which is fair, but they're also rigid and uncontrollable. Where in Web of Shadows you could web grind someone in any direction, in air, on the ground, into a building, kick them off, into other enemies and so on. It was far more freeform by nature, it's a beat-em-up, where this game is much more Arkham-like. And so, it's far more effort to do something interesting. In Web of Shadows, an amazing looking attack is only a few button presses away. Here, it's going to require a little setup and quite a bit of luck. On top of that, the coolest methods of dealing damage there were always among the best ways of dealing damage. This is simply not true for Spider-Man PS4. With gadgets, sometimes the reverse is true. This makes the combat easier to get bored of. Which might be controversial, but I've played this game a hell of a lot for this video. And like the swinging, I struggle to enjoy combat after 15 minutes of chucking thugs off roofs. With the amount of freedom offered, it's completely understandable that balancing and encouraging all the attacks would be so difficult. Yet if it's significantly improved on this, I can see it becoming the best superhero combat system ever made. I can't wait to see what they'll do for the sequel. I might have spent far longer complaining about it than I have praising it, but what I praised far outweighs what I criticised. It's a brilliant system, but it's a shame that the stealth side of combat didn't get treated quite so well. Stealth in this game is pretty much entirely inspired by Beanox's games. It was pretty bare bones and shattered dimensions, but I still loved it because I loved the setting. A few years later, they upped the ante with their amazing Spider-Man games. I really enjoyed the albeit glitchy stealth sections of those games. It was good fun, especially clearing out the hideouts to get a few new suits in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Here, stealth happens in the story sometimes, not counting the MJ and Miles missions, the Taskmaster challenges, kinda, and the hideouts. Essentially, it boils down to R3 scanning enemies, and if it says safe, you grab them with the perch takedown. If not, you wait. If there's no one in earshot, which is pretty easy to judge, you can just hit triangle to web strike takedown them. You can also go up behind them for these cool little stealth takedowns, but they're largely pointless. Perch takedowns are almost always doable and are always less risky because on the ground, if you hit square at the wrong time, you'll just plonk him over the head and blow your cover. For larger groups, the way to disperse them is by throwing a web at a distraction object. Not exactly depth, but it's something more to do than hit R3 and spam square. There is also a vent takedown, which is cool, but it's not particularly 
particularly useful because you can only use it twice in the entire game. Great. Most stealth sections boil down to flying around, hitting triangle to take out all the snipers, picking off enemies with perch takedowns, and then maybe dispersing groups with a distraction object. The AI will not react to their entire crew going down in any way at all. There is nothing to hack. You can't web up cameras, there's no gadgets to use apart from the insta-kills, no specific environmental takedowns other than the shelves, and no good level design. Seriously, the level design sucks for these arenas. In The Amazing Spider-Man 2, you'd have multiple levels, and you could rappel down taking out enemies as you go. Not so here, because enemies are always on open roofs, and there's not even a good rappel feature. If not roofs, they're in hideouts, where there's girders. Stealth is fun, sometimes, but there's an amazing lack of depth that had me yearning for The Amazing Spider-Man of all things. The Spider-Man games have a long way to go with regards to stealth. I'd like to see better level design, a proper rappel feature, good gadget integration, more objects to interact with in stealth than the shelves and occasionally a crane, a stealth takedown feature that isn't both unreliable and pointless, enemy design that you actually have to play around like night vision and invisibility, and finally, the total removal of everyone being alerted the instant you're spotted in Taskmaster challenges. Unless this guy speaks at 50,000 words per minute, he's not saying shit simply because he caught a glimpse of Spider-Man before being webbed to a wall. Sorry, WHILE being webbed to a wall. Speaking of Taskmaster challenges, these are entirely judged on time, and it's an insta-fail if you're spotted, even if he then immediately goes down. So what results is a trial and error to find the perfect route through a stealth arena. Or at least a route quick enough to get ultimate. I enjoyed this, but it's not exactly a test of your stealth ability, because you're just throwing yourself at it trying to find the perfect sequence of guys to take out. There's very little creativity and courage, because enemies are never very close together, and they're easily dispersed. Truth be told, I can't think of anything they could have done in replacement. The system it has to test you on is so simplistic that what could you judge but time? I'm hoping for more enemy types in the DLC and some serious expansion in the sequel. Because it's a PlayStation exclusive, Spider-Man PS4 of course has an extremely cutscene-rich narrative. When it tries to be emotional or epic, the game does phenomenally. When it tries to be smart, it's not so good. Let me run you through it. Essentially, the first two-thirds of the game are dedicated to Martin Lee and Mr. Negative's plan to bring down Norman Osborn, to expose him as the evil man he is. After you put Fisk away in the first mission, Lee, who's been working with Aunt May at the homeless shelter beforehand, sees his opportunity. His plan is to find and secure the Devil's Breath, and force Norman to release it. He also plans on killing anyone related to it. The lion's share of the first acts are dedicated to investigating this plan. Who Lee really is, why he and the demons are terrorising the city and attacking Fisk's men, what they want, what the devil's breath is, and how to stop them. After infiltrating Norman's office, you find out, as Donkey hilariously pointed out, from a PowerPoint presentation, that devil's breath is actually a disease, intended as a cure but a bioweapon in practice. As the demons become more and more of a problem, Norman Osborn hires a PMC called Sable International, run by Silver Sablin over, who's basically the high school bully of the story. They turn the city into a military state. Meanwhile, City Hall is attacked, killing Miles Morales' dad, who is being honoured as a hero for helping Spider-Man save a train full of civilians from a truck. After endless prancing about with detective work and playing cat and mouse with Mr. Negative, Spider-Man finds Dr. Michaels, who is the only man in the city with a sample of Devil's Breath. Sable plans on transporting Michaels to a safe house, as MJ's investigative work revealed, but Lee predictably attacks it, loses Michaels to Spider-Man, but manages to hold on to the Devil's Breath. MJ finds out where it's going to be released, Grand Central Station. There's an Oscorp dispersal device on display, and it's already located in the perfect place to start a pandemic. Lee wants Norman to be there himself. If he releases the Devil's Breath, he will be responsible for the deaths. You manage to disarm the bomb through careful teamwork, and after a train Barney, you take down Lee. His plan is in tatters. You won. As you've been fighting through the demons, Peter and Otto Octavius have worked together frequently to help develop prosthetics. Through your help, Otto was able to give back a disabled veteran his arm. But Norman Osborn shut him down. Despite all funding being lost, Peter tells Otto that he'll stay because what they're doing is so important. Otto continually improves on the prosthetics as time passes, but it becomes clear something's wrong. He isn't healthy. It turns out Otto suffers from ALS. He loses control of his muscles, but his mind lives on. So he's doing this for himself, too. The problem is, the neural network that Otto uses to control the prosthetics incorrectly targets non-motor neurons, changing the personality of the user. But Otto doesn't listen to Peter's warnings. After some time with Miles, who's been working at Feast to get over his dad's death, the Sable car carrying the reacquired Devil's Breath is attacked, the Devil Breath stolen, and Riker's Island compromised. You and Yuri try to quell the riots, but it's not long before the raft is breached too. Electro, Vulture, Rhino, Scorpion, Lee, every one of your enemies is freed. They lead you up to the roof where you put up a desperate fight, but it's not good enough. And it turns out that they're all working for Otto. Otto
Otto warns Spider-Man to never interfere with his plans again and chucks him out to sea. With Spider-Man down, no one's to stop him from releasing the Devil's Breath, bringing the city to its knees. The next part of the game is dedicated to curing the Devil's Breath and bringing down the Sinister Six. The prisoners run amok and Sable target you and them indiscriminately. You fight desperately through the prisoners, save the police from Rhino and Electro, stop May and Miles from burning to death, even going so far as to almost die yourself. You eventually find Otto's lair at Times Square, and inside you get a picture of how he managed to bring together the Sinister Six. He developed a suit for Electro that allows him to get closer to pure energy, a cure for Vulture's spinal cancer, a way to free Rhino from his suit, money for Scorpion's debts, and revenge on Osborne for Lee. Lee is supposed to be using something called Icarus to get into Oscorp, but that's just a ruse to get Spider-Man into the perfect position for a bomb, which was on a timer that easily allows for an escape for some reason. You then fight Electro and Vulture at the power plant. Soon after goes Scorpion and Rhino, leaving only Lee and Octavius. MJ infiltrates Osborne's personal penthouse to find out where the cure for Devil's Breath is. She eventually finds her way into a secret compartment, and finds out that Harry's trip to Europe was a cover for him being sick from some kind of neurodegenerative disease. Devil's Breath was supposed to be a cure. Norman failed to save Emily, his wife and Harry's mother, but he's willing to do anything to save Harry. MJ tracks down the facility with a cure, and Spider-Man heads there next. Sable and demons hold you up for far too long, but you manage to convince Silver Sable that working together is the only way to get Lee. You fight Lee and put him down once and for all, but before you can escape with the anti-serum, Doc Ock shows up, smacks you about, and leaves with the serum. Silver Sable saves you, and MJ explains to Spider-Man that he needs help from Peter Parker, but not before a spider from Osborne's lab finds its way onto Miles. Peter develops an anti-backstabbing bastard suit and uses it to fight Dr. Octopus atop Oscorp Tower. He wins, gets the anti-serum, but he only has one dose. They can either synthesize a cure to save everyone, or use it now on Aunt May who's been infected from the beginning. Spider-Man knows what he wants to do, but also what the right thing is. And from that, Aunt May dies, a haunting embodiment of what Spider-Man really represents. Six months later, Peter gets back with MJ, Miles reveals his powers, and Norman reveals that Harry was in the secret lab all along, being kept alive by a black symbiote. Sequel bait set. That's the story in essence. I have two major issues with the plot itself, and they are the jarring shift from Mr. Negative to the Sinister Six, and the Devil's Breath Hunt. Let's start with the first one. You spend the first two thirds of the game fighting Mr. Negative and his revenge plot against Norman. He's a good villain, an opposite of Spider-Man. After losing his parents, he was consumed by revenge, where Peter learned to do everything he could to stop others from suffering the same fate. He's also clearly intelligent, which keeps you guessing, and has a lot of depth from his alter ego as Martin Lee. You know there's a great man who's helped hundreds of people in there, but you don't know if you can get him back. The train fight was pretty anticlimactic if I'm honest, but that seemed to be because they knew they had to top it when you rematch. After what felt like an age fightingly, all of a sudden the raft is breached and the Sinister Six formed. Now, Otto was set up, but Rhino, Vulture, Electro and Scorpion just come out of nowhere to suddenly take centre stage. If you've spent the entire a game fighting one villain, for him to suddenly be replaced by another villain, who by the way has the exact same motivations as Lee, everything that came before seems a tad devalued. It would have been a lot less jarring if there was any level of setup. We knew that Otto was going bad, but every other villain comes out of nowhere. In Web of Shadows, every character in Act 3, bar Black Widow, has a role to play in either Act 1 or 2. Everyone you fight later is set up. Not so here. It feels like an incredibly unnatural shift, because there's no history between you and the villains in the game. It's all just implied. They have no arcs because of how little screen time they have, so there's no time to make them interesting. Every single member of the Six, apart from Otto and Lee, have their motivations explained by an audio log, all at the same time. These goals never tie into the engagements and they just dropped immediately. Guess Vulture's dying of cancer then. It would have been nice to see evidence in the lab of Otto making the cure for Vulture's cancer, or maybe the effects on organised crime when Scorpion's debts were being meddled with. It's a shame because it really doesn't feel like a cohesive plot. The other problem I have is the Devil's Breath. The game paces itself well. Whenever it gets boring, there's immediately a set piece or a boss fight to get you going again. But eye-catching visuals and QTEs can only do so much. Much. You spend what feels like an age following an uninteresting breadcrumb trail to get to the Devil's Breath. First you're investigating a shipping company warehouse, then you're going to some random guy called Charles Standish, then you're going to another random guy called Isaac Delaney, then you're protecting another random guy called Dr. Michaels. And you have to do two of the dullest MJ missions in that time frame too. It feels like padding, even if it isn't. I enjoyed all the missions here, but I was losing my investment in the plot rapidly, because simply put, bouncing about like a pinball from boring character to boring character to find slight more about the Devil's Breath is just boring. This only lasts for so long, but it's easily the weakest part of the game. That's not the only problem though. The Devil's Breath itself is a tired plot device. A super virus? In New York? In a Spider-Man game? 
Gee, when has that ever been done before? I mean, people were complaining that Web of Shadows had an unoriginal setup, and then The Amazing Spider-Man did it again, but with rat people, and now Insomniac's done the exact same thing, but with literally just a virus instead of a complex and mysterious alien race. The Devil's Breath has a nice tie into Harry, because it's intended as a cure for his neurodegenerative disease. I like that, but it's nothing more than a virus outside of its intention, which had been done enough times, not just in Spider-Man games, but in games in general. Prototype was practically the same premise too. MacGuffin plot devices are usually written off as weak altogether, but they don't have to be. The portrayal of Titanfall 2's arc was simply immaculate. You got to see its powers, grasp at its mysteries, and slowly understand its role in the plot as you progress through one of the best FPS levels I've ever played in my life. Everything about it was interesting. Was it alien? What could it really do? What happened here? How could it change time like this? Who was it made for? What was it made for? What does the enemy want to do with it? Devil's Breath, though, has but two questions. What does the enemy want with it, and what is it? Basic questions that present very little intrigue. A bit more creativity would have gone miles here. Speaking of whom, Miles. I really like Miles in this game. I love his dialogue, the parallels with Peter, and amazingly, I enjoyed most if not all of the Miles missions. But he's pointless. He's just there because he's Miles Morales. If you cut him out, the plot would be the exact same. That concludes my problems with the plot. What it gets right, it really gets right. Namely, the way it balances time between low-level, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man stuff, badass superhero stuff, and Peter Parker stuff. I was scared that the Peter Parker segments would be boring as hell before the game came out, but I don't think that true. Despite the fact that you get a whole five sections with Otto, which are mostly cutscenes, it feels like you've spent an age with him. In every segment, something major punctuates it. A reveal, Otto being shut down, Otto finally succeeding, but you finding out about his disease, the neural net changing his personality. When you aren't being Spider-Man, the game always finds another way to entertain you. Apart from once, you never spend more than five minutes a feast, indicative of dense content. Everything you care about and want to see from Peter Parker is packed into short segments so you don't get too bored. They even include a run button, thank god for that. All of this effectively shows the other half of Spider-Man, allowing for a more personal element between MJ, May, Miles, Lee and Otto that enhances the characters, Spider-Man most of all, and amplifies emotional scenes such as May's death, or the fight with Octavius. The plot does this for Miles and MJ too. Not always as successfully though. It was nice to see MJ being useful and showing her heart in the GCT section. It was also very fun to feel vulnerable and small, which is no better expressed than when you're running away from Rhino as Miles. This entire section feels shot like a horror movie. It's really something. Having control of Miles as you run through the smoke to find your dad who lays dead at the epicenter of a bombing is easily among the most emotional moments in the game, and it only could have worked if the player had control of Miles. Sadly though, we're also subjected to painfully boring sections too, mostly as MJ. Sneaking through Tombstone's base does nothing for her character. It's just a plot point we could have gotten from an infinitely more entertaining mission. Same deal with the Sable encampment. Unless there's real stakes and some very creative setup, they default to a horrifically dull stealth section. Which brings me off the plot and onto some general story criticism. The MJ and Miles sections do go far to make them not boring, but not far enough. They're always stealth sections with guards who you distract by either chucking a lure as MJ, knocking something over, or hacking something as Miles. It's the same basic crap every time. A guard's in your way? Well, you'll have to press L2 and R1 with nothing else to consider every time. I honestly don't understand why some of these sections are in the game. If they do nothing for the character and are utterly unengaging gameplay-wise, Surely it'd be better to come up with some other way for Spider-Man to learn about Tombstone or the attack on GCT. I liked two of the three Miles missions and two of the five MJ missions, but four out of eight just doesn't cut it for me. Your mileage may vary. Another thing I didn't like about the non-Spider-Man sections were the puzzles. There are indeed puzzles in this game, but when I say puzzles, I don't mean like Tomb Raider or Portal. I mean like a kid's game you download on your iPad. The first game you get is the circuit one. You get a bunch of pieces and you have to route the energy from the green node to the yellow one, with the selection of pieces given. Given. You honestly have to be a grade A, 24 karat, gold plated dipstick to struggle with the ones the game asks you to do. Or, you might have genuine difficulties with things like this, and in that case I do have to congratulate the game's inclusion of a skip button, although I kinda doubt it's just people with difficulties who are going to be using it. There are tons of optional ones you can do for research tokens at Otto's lab, which might be challenging, but for some reason I can't be asked to try them. The way the game tries to make the circuit puzzles challenging is by including special corner pieces that only go one way so you have to use them in specific corners of the track. But even if you get it completely wrong, it takes about 5 seconds to go back and fix it. 
Same deal with the voltage mechanic. Some puzzles start you out with a target voltage and an actual voltage. You have voltage pieces that go in the green and red slots. Green add voltage and red remove it. Now, you could do the maths, considering how many pieces of each voltage you have and where to put them, but you could just put whatever down, compare actual to target at the end and make a few simple readjustments. As for the direction to lay the track, there's a set amount of pieces which gives you all the clues you need. The empty voltage nodes, if they exist, clearly need to be used so you know that you'll need to go through them. There's no effort involved in this, and even if you get it wrong, again, it takes 10 seconds to fix it. The other puzzle type is spectrographs. You have to combine the pieces so that the black space is filled in. You might get negative pieces that cancel stuff out, which is something more to consider. Sometimes it'll make it a little more challenging by having a piece that matches two graphs, but that's dealt with by trial and error. At the end of the day, they require you to compare some lines. I've been more engaged asleep. Even if they were challenging, these puzzles simply aren't fun in my opinion, and for the benefit of giving Peter Parker a gameplay thing to do, I really don't don't think it was worth it. If it increased your immersion, you might consider it a plus, but it did the exact opposite for me. On a more positive note, the realisation of the characters is pretty incredible. Norman is a ruthless businessman who hurts anyone beneath him, but he still does everything he can to save his family. Dr. Puss is a great guy with an amazing mind and an iron will to improve as many lives as he can. There's an interesting questioning of whether Otto is a redeemable character, because there's evidence to suggest that it wasn't just the neural net that changed his personality. He always wanted to do this. There was always this side to him. I also love Otto's little Icarus ruse. Smart villains in media are usually portrayed as long-term schemers, but the short term is just as important, and very few characters ever capture that. Otto lying about Icarus on the map just to get Spider-Man into a specific part of the lair was great. It actually made me appreciate that this is a really intelligent character. Lee is extremely similar, and the contrast between the selfless humanitarian and the revenge-driven maniac is very appropriate. It would have been a lot more effective though if we got to spend more than three cutscenes with the good version of Lee. We never really got to build a connection with him like we did with Otto, so there's no personal element to the betrayal or the conclusion, which I felt was a missed opportunity. I also didn't like that Otto and Lee had the exact same plan. Release the devil's breath, blame Norman. It was dumb enough the first time, it's slightly annoying the second time. It's fair that Lee would want to use the very thing that killed his parents to bring Osborne down, even if it is slightly overkill to infect an entire city with a bioweapon because you want revenge on one guy. But it's not fair that Otto would want to do the exact same thing. Whether or not Otto was involved in the Devil's Breath program, infecting an entire city with a bioweapon, then dangling Norman off a roof and dropping him, doesn't really put the blame on Norman. It puts the blame on Otto. For someone so smart, I'd have expected a bit more plan to his evil plan. That's enough on the Devil's Breath duo. May is May, Miles is Miles, the concerned guardian and the aspiring teenager. But MJ has changed a lot. She is modernised, with a different fashion sense and a drive to be the one that saves people instead of the one being saved. This is handled with a lot of maturity. We see that Peter never lets her help, and that MJ can be extremely reckless. This results in both characters reconciling with each other in dialogue. They apologise to each other and stay partners. I think the game really sells you on the heroic MJ at GCT when she immediately steps forward to save a man about to be executed. Reckless, yes, but also entirely selfless. It made me like her a lot more. This was, however, the fourth MJ mission. It probably would have been a bit better earlier on, because I was starting to really dislike the character after she infiltrated her third highly secured compound where a single slip-up would be lethal. With regards to some more minor villains, the Sinister Six was done excellently. Rhino's suit looks badass and he's written hilariously. Vulture doesn't get much attention, but Electro was a lot better. His personality is wildly different from every other realisation, this time being a lot more youthful. He's thrilled by action and even gets your jokes, which was probably the best thing about this entire boss fight. Scorpion is a massive dickhead, but the way he tortures your mind in this Poison Lake mission is brilliant. I loved how he makes you question whether he's real or not. And with the traversal challenge, I felt it was a really strong mission altogether. Every member of the group is well represented, and it goes to show just how much of a shame their tiny screen times are. Silver Sable is pretty much the only wild card in the game. I really like this representation. She's a believable leader of a PMC, but she's also a massive dick and a complete plum. It's hard to like a bully, and my god, Peter gets bullied by this woman. First time she comes in, she restrains him and threatens his life. Second time she kicks his ass, and the third time she holds him at gunpoint. I swear that this 
this is the same guy who just soloed the entire Sinister Six for like 30 whole seconds? Of course, it would be completely unreasonable to attack her, but her army has kind of occupied the entire city, targets the only person who might be able to save them, routinely locks people up in cages for protesting, commandeers people's property, and robs them blind. Sable does more damage to the city than Rhino, Vulture, Scorpion, Tombstone, Taskmaster, and Electro do combined. She literally runs a military oppressors for hire corporation, yet she calls you a problem? Then, when she holds you at gunpoint, Peter tries to convince her to let him go, and she accepts? So she's just suddenly decided that being reasonable is a good thing? I like that you get to work with her in the end, but her entire personality just flips on a dime. When you get rushed by Dr. Octopus, she runs in saying, hey, hey, as if they didn't just hate each other three minutes ago. And once you're back to health, she leaves the city. She wonders if what she does is moral. So it was Spider-Man asking her not to kill him that swayed her, not the revolutions she started and the people she's robbed and probably murdered. Right, of course. This is a pitiful conclusion. I think it might be expanded on in the third DLC, but you have to pay for that, so I don't care. Overall, I'd say the characters were immaculately realised. Every character is done justice and brought to life believably. Some characters are complete dumbasses, but that's more a fault of the plot than anything else. It's a great show. Speaking of which, anyone like explosions? The presentation of the story is utterly spectacular. Cinematics are always shot well, good editing, nice uses of slow-mo, good lighting, amazing character models, and incredible facial animation. It's really impressive where we're at now with this tech. This isn't the cream of the crop, but it brings out just how great the acting is, so it does everything it needs to. Voice and movements in the game are beyond fantastic. Yuri Lowenthal as Peter Parker is easily the best voice the character's had in the movies or the games in my opinion. I tried, but he's not very talkative. Plus, I think he hates me. You have that effect on a lot of people. But you love me, right, Yuri? I tolerate you. Wow. That might be the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Toby and Tom are good, but I don't think anyone captures the youthful essence of the character so well, yet at the same time gets the serious emotions just as good. Martin Lee is another highlight. Mr. Positive voices Mr. Negative in this game, and manages to give Lee compassion when he's not being a dickhead, and when he is, an amazing amount of seething anger. I was shocked by just how good the voice for MJ was until I realised Laura Bailey was doing it. Things like this, the human element, is always extremely hard to analyse. It's either good or it's not, so it's difficult to go into detail, but there's still a clear difference between good and bad. There's not much better than this. Every other character is at least good. I didn't like Kingpin so much, he had no charisma whatsoever. But on the other end of the spectrum, with equally little screen time, Electra was a favourite. I loved his accent and his movements in every scene he was in. I don't think these moments are going to be what sticks in people's heads though. That's probably going to be the set pieces. It's really only this game and arguably The Amazing Spider-Man that's done stuff like this. So it's surprising that the set pieces in this game make movie Spider-Man look like a massive pussy. You literally swing a helicopter through the city and fight guys on top of a truck and fly down an exploding elevator shaft and pull out a truck of the path of a train and a train of the path of another train. Problem is though, you don't. Not you. Despite the fact that these set pieces are among the most important things about the story, because getting to see them is easily among the plot's most powerful hooks, you don't really get any control. They're mostly QTEs. The only time they aren't, it's either a cutscene or beating up basic enemies as you usually do. Compared to Uncharted, the difference is clear. Yeah, it's rife with scripted sections, but you get more control over the epic events than button prompts. Not all the set pieces in this game would lend themselves very well to more dynamism, but this seems like a thing that's decided upon from inception. But they could have been so much more if they were designed from the start to be more than button prompt controlled cutscenes. A lack of dynamism is a problem that permeates the entire story. Among the only non-combat or traversal based gameplay you'll do in the game is firing electric webs and junction boxes. What is this even supposed to be? It's just pressing a button. How is this gameplay variety? You're just going up to boxes and pressing the same button over and over. They do this three times in the story if I remember correctly, and most games would expand on it as the game goes on. This doesn't. But the problem is no worse than it is with the bosses. For this, I'm going to go through all the bosses of the game, fight by fight, looking at what worked and what didn't. The game's going up against some pretty damn good encounters in the same franchise, so it's got a lot cut out for it. I'll be excluding Kingpin because it's very early on, and so only serves as a tutorial for the brutes. The first non-Kingpin fight in the game is Shocker, everyone's favourite Spider-Man villain. The Shocker fight is actually a two-parter, which would have caught me by surprise if I didn't already know it was going to happen after the E3 demo. The first part has you stumble onto him as he finishes a robbery. It's a chase, just like Electro from Web of Shadows. 
However, unlike Web of Shadows, this chase is completely on rails. You chase him, but distance means jack all. And you can only do damage at two points. They flow right into the cutscenes, which would be a lot more impressive if Shocker wasn't programmed to slow down and be catchable and near enough the same time every time. After you get him the first time, he'll chuck a couple of shock blast things at you, which requires a tap of the dodge button. The chase is sold by its looks, and nothing more. Soon after, Shocker robs a bank. This is the fight we saw at E3. The fight revolves around dodging his attacks, waiting for an opening, and then chucking something at him to get some hits in. There are three phases. Phase 1 is just that. Phase 2 has an area of effect shock that encourages you to swing above the ground, and Phase 3 is the same as Phase 1, but he never moves and you need to pull down this ceiling ornament. The attacks he puts out are simple and easy to dodge. You also have very little agency in how you do damage, but you do get more choice than before as to when. There are multiple openings you can exploit in the fight, when he's jumping, if you time it right after a dodge, and of course, when he's ran out of juice. You can use your skill to make the fight go faster, so it's at least more than a pretty swinging section. This was alright. The next boss is quite far after Shocker, Mr. Negative. The first Mr. Negative boss fight looks very cool indeed. You're smashing each other about a train as it increasingly becomes more withered. You even go into another, more populated train at one point, which gives a little more tension to the scene. The mechanics, though, are about as shallow as you'd expect. He's got a big vertical slice that you dodge to the side of, and a shockwave type thing that you jump to the ceiling for. That's pretty much his moveset. You attack whenever there's a green prompt. As soon as your attacks start phasing through him, you have to dodge backwards, and it's rinse repeat. At a later phase, he'll delay his attacks, which throws you off, and he'll mix them up rapidly, but that's about as hard as the fight gets. When you've beaten him, you try to Spider-Man to it to stop the train, but that doesn't work. So instead, you pull up the floor and send the train into the overground street, which conveniently was disused. Right. How Spider-Man managed to pull up the floor, and that section of the floor specifically, so well that it could support the weight of a mother ducking train, I don't know. The next fight of the game is the first of the Sinister Six fights, and it goes for a double team. Makes sense given the pacing of the game. The Vulture and Electro boss fight is pretty fun, but also pretty broken. Vulture is by far the easiest of the two to damage. He swoops at you all the time, and you get a damage window for dodging it. Same thing if you chuck his knife projectile things back at him. There's constantly ways to deal damage to him, and so you get more focus, which gets you finishes. I'm pretty sure this is a callback to Web of Shadows, or maybe Web of Shadows was calling back to something else. But I love the reference no matter what it was to anyway. Point is, it's really easy to damage Vulture, but no matter how much you do, it seems the game wants you to be fighting Electro. Electro is really easy to finish comparatively. All you have to do is destroy the Transform, Transformers. Electro going to the next Transformer might be tied to his health, but it didn't seem that I had to do much damage at all. As the boss fights in the game go, I was surprised that you had any influence at all over which guy to take out first, but this fight does have a passing level of depth. There are multiple ways to damage each character, each character's attacks make focusing on one of them more difficult, and you have to keep moving, but not in the exact same way like in Shocker's fight. It's fairly good, it certainly looks the part. The Rhino and Scorpion boss fight follows a similar formula, and is probably my favourite in the game. Rhino by himself is dealt with by bringing down environmental objects on him, which opens up a damage window. Time slows when Rhino is vulnerable to an object, but if he's close he might hit you anyway, so positioning is really important. You want Rhino to have a straight shot on you and his path to intersect with an environmental object that you can easily interact with. Rhino will also chuck pieces of the ground at you, and if any of his attacks land, you get shot back tens of meters, which I thought looked great. Gives a more super vibe to the fight when you're getting up from attacks as forceful as that. Once you've damaged Rhino enough, Scorpion shows up. His mechanics are even simpler. You web him up, he falls over, you smack him about, rinse repeat. His attacks are a poison throw and a quick strike on your location. Like the Electro and Vulture fight, each of their attacks make it harder to focus on one. When you're damaging Rhino, Scorpion might chuck a poison blob at you. When you're damaging Scorpion, you have to watch out for being bulldozed by Rhino. But unlike the Vulture and Electro fight, you can actually count for that instead of just dodging. You want to be webbing Scorpion when Rhino is far away, and you can easily bait Rhino into that. You want to attack Rhino when Scorpion doesn't have line of sight. And to make it a little more entertaining, the banter between Rhino and Scorpion in this fight is hilarious. Rhino thinks Scorpion's an annoying dickhead, but Scorpion thinks Rhino's an infant in an eight-ton body. They insult each other continuously. What were you gonna do if I didn't show up? Beg him to give up? You even get a unique line if Rhino hits Scorpion. When you've done enough damage, they start fighting each other, you lock them in a shipping container, and that's that. Really don't see how this is meant to hold them. It wasn't much of a spectacle like the other fights, but it at least had some pretty cool mechanics. There weren't as many ways to damage Rhino and Scorpion as there were to damage Vulture and Electro, but at least the double team contributed a hell of a lot. The next, and probably the best fight, is the Mr. Negative rematch. He's not much different from a demon swordsman in the first phase, you just dodge, chuck throwables, and wail on him until 
until you get an opening. Since he's like a normal human enemy, you can air launch him and keep the combo going for increased efficiency. You can even use environmental attacks here. The air one is the best because the spin you get on the ground is just wasted time. Later on, you'll go into the negative realm. Two major things change here. One, there'll be a bunch of Dark Souls sprites to punch, and two, you'll have to fight this big ass demon. He'll swipe the floor and also do a smash attack. If you swing away, these attacks are pathetically easy to dodge. But you do of course need to contend with the continuous distraction presented by the sprites. After you ward away the demon, it's just you versus a horde of sprites and Mr. Negative. You're completely overwhelmed, so you're just waiting for a small opening on the boss. It's not many attacks later that you finally win, and that's that. You finally beat Lee. I greatly enjoyed this fight. The first phase feels less restrictive than any of the other bosses so far, because you can use all your attacks apart from the gadgets in some capacity. The second phase has the added variation of the sprites and the demon, with the demon adding two new attacks to avoid. The final phase isn't deep, but it feels really good because it's like you're making the hard final push to beat this long fought adversary. I also very much enjoyed the fight's length, because it's supposed to be an epic conclusive showdown, and because it makes it a lot more difficult, which I suppose contributes to the same feeling. It's far better than the first. The final has this to top. The Doctor Octopus fight has a lot to deal with. It needs to be a fun boss fight, and also the conclusion of an epic superhero adventure. It's not got the scale of Web of Shadows' Mega Venom. Instead, it goes for something a lot more personal. But first, let's talk about the mechanics. Doc Ock's two attacks are whipping forward one of his arms and coming down with a smash. You've got to get him up to a certain level of stunness to get a damage window, and you can do that with webs and environmental objects. Webs are invaluable in this fight for that exact reason. The best time to fire them off is just after a smash attack, so it's a good strategy to dodge over and over again until you can get him to do it. If you go into the air, he'll chuck a bunch of objects at you, which, because you're in the air, you can redirect quickly. If you're quick enough, one object like that alone can get you a damage window. So all in all, air and ground combat are viable, and you can get a damage window from webs and throwables. For this game, that's a fair amount of choice. At two points in the fight, Doc Ock will jump on the pole thing, and that somehow makes the floor so hot that it glows. Seems like a design flaw in the building, to be honest. All you have to do is chuck an object in his face as usual, and then press triangle to kick his ass back down. After you smack him up for the second time, you're thrust into a cutscene. You take out the safety thingy on Otto's neural network, but he smashes your mask. You try to hide your face, but it's pointless. He knew all along. Revealing that Otto knew allows for a far more emotional conclusion between Peter Parker and Octavius. You're not really fighting just a Spider-Man anymore. You're fighting is both sides of the coin, which feels perfectly appropriate for a game that gave Peter so much attention. The next phase takes place on the walls of Oscorp. It's a simple match of spamming square and hitting dodge at the right time, but it's made something epic by the score and Peter's anger towards Octavius. This was certainly the most cinematic of the fights, and easily one of the deepest. I very much enjoyed it. But the main story bosses aren't all you get. There's also a couple of optionals. Tombstone is a fair bit of fun because his fight's got a nice arena, and Tombstone himself is a well-written character. Aside from that, he's just a brute with a big chain. Enjoyable enough. But Taskmaster's fight is really disappointing. It's nice that he can use your finishes against you because he's the IGN of punching people, but he's not a match for Spider-Man. He's just a basic demon swordsman with a shockwave attack and a fancy skin. There's nothing at all to him. You just dodge and use throwables to open him up, like the swordsman, and then smack him about until he falls over. He's got a really small health pool. I expected a real match for Spider-Man, like Black Cat from Web of Shadows, but this is not what we got. In the end, every boss suffers from a lack of depth. They have generally uninspired movesets, only a half even have more than one way to damage them, and some of them are just jumped up reskins. But there is an impressive amount of spectacle to all of them, and occasionally there's some really creative mechanics. The double team in Rhino and Scorpion was used really well, and the way the game overwhelms you is greatly effective in the Mr. Negative fight. It's a shame that they're far from memorable, and have a very long way to come. They're symptomatic of the game's lack of dynamism. But that's not just an issue on the first playthrough. Spider-Man PS4 has a serious replayability problem. The game sells its first run on how amazing everything looks, because all the plot and dialogue is new. Of course, plot and dialogue will always weaken dramatically on repeat playthroughs. There's no intrigue anymore because you already know everything. But there's no reason the actual gameplay needs to suffer the same fate. Yet it does. 90% of the set-piece missions are endless QTEs. Amazing QTEs, yes. But it's just button mashing to keep a cutscene playing no matter how you look at it. It's the same no matter how many playthroughs you do. So it's just boring the second time. Boss fights have very little depth. It's not like you can deal damage from a hundred different sources like in Web of Shadows. This complete lack of player 
player agency gravely diminishes repeat playthroughs, I had a really hard time enjoying my second run of the game. Whenever the missions opened up, like in the Fisk construction site or the Rikers Island section, it was fine, but these moments are few and far between. And that concludes my story critique. The plot was brought down by an extremely jarring villain shift and a boring MacGuffin plot device, but it was competent enough to pace out an epic Spider-Man adventure, including eight villains, a PMC, Norman Osborn, multiple set pieces, Miles Morales, a new version of MJ, a personal connection to the game's main villain, multiple heartbreaking moments, every aspect of Peter Parker's personal life, and even some detective work. The game manages to cram all of that into a 15-20 to 20 hour game, and it only has one bad patch. That's impressive. They could have done with puzzles that either didn't exist or didn't suck, a much better conclusion for Silver Sable, a reason for Miles to exist, significantly better boss fights, and much better design of the MJ slash Miles stealth sections. But given how ambitious the story is, and that it still managed to be better than some if not most Spider-Man movies, I'd say it did pretty damn great, and it continues to excel even after the curtains close. So, the end game. Depending on who you are, this will have wildly differing levels of importance to you, because some people, which is basically 99% of reviewers, will get through the game once, do a bit of side stuff, and then leave. More hardcore fans, though, will be extremely appreciative of a rich end game. This is where most of the replay value comes from, after all, and Insomniac is nothing if not attentive to their fans. After the story ends, the city doesn't revert to a status quo. It continues where you left off, which provides some often lacking story continuity. You'll have a conversation with Yuri about the state of the city, and she shows that she likes you, which is a sweetly satisfying ending to the banter you had with her throughout the game. The prisoners from the raft still run amok. Demons and Sable are causing trouble too. You get to fight pretty much every faction but Kingpin's men, and there'll still be plenty of active crimes to do. The frequency of active crimes showing up at this point is at its highest. This might be an intentional touch, I might just be crazy, or it might be because the game simply has all the factions at play by now, and there's no story mission, so naturally there's a lot of crimes. Either way, the result is that getting into combat on your own terms, like Web of Shadows, is never a problem. You've still got Taskmaster challenges in his boss fight to complete, all the collectibles, all the side missions, and any suits you want to go for. With regards to long-term replayability, there is no endless arena, which I must say is a shame. Still, when it comes to reliably difficult combat encounters, you can do any of the bases you've done before, and even go for the bonus objectives, which was a smart way of getting people to replay them. On top of that, you can go into research stations and change the time of day. Thank you, Insomniac. This is awesome. Not as awesome as it should be, though. Why is there no rain option? The end game is about completionism, mastery and having mindless fun with the mechanics. In a Spider-Man game, it's mostly about swinging around for fun, so having that combined with a relaxing, rainy setting would have really hooked me into the end game. but this is simply not an option. You could just advance the new game plus to a rainy section and swing around there, but then you wouldn't have the same amount of active crimes unlocked or the same bases to complete, and of course, new game plus isn't actually out at the time of scripting. It might be at the time of release, rain might be too, but it's still worth mentioning that it wasn't at launch, no matter how small a time window that may be in the long run. Aside from the rain, the end game is excellent. It has everything you want it to, and handily beats The Amazing Spider-Man 1, which until now had the best endgame of the lot. I have heard rumours that Sable, Prisoner, and Demon crimes disappear after you finish five in each district. If that's true, I will assume this is going to be dealt with in a patch, because I quite like my heart in its current state. Well then, time to answer the question we were asking from the start. Is Spider-Man PS4 the best Spider-Man game ever made? Well, when it comes to objectivity, what you're really doing is judging something based on what you believe to be the average tastes of the audience who matter. You've created a persona, and you're judging subjectively based on what you believe this persona's like. So, what does the average Spider-Man fan like? A good story? Check. Good combat? Check. Large and alive New York? Check. Momentum-based swinging where webs attach to buildings? Check. Plenty of side content? Check. Extensive suit choice? Check. Random crimes? Check. Free roam after story completion? Check. Web of Shadows, the bar that this game had to beat, does not fare as well. It didn't have a conventional design. I love that, and I stand behind everything I said in that video. But this game has everything the average player wants from a Spider-Man game. And most importantly, I believe it does many of these things better than any other Spider-Man game. At least from the Persona's perspective. It has easily the best story, suit choice, crimes, and city. The side stuff isn't great, but it's probably better than any other Spider-Man game. With regards to combat and swinging, it's a little more complicated. Combat is going to be the best if you don't prefer Web of Shadows combat. If you didn't like that as much, then PS4 has easily the best of the lot. Spider-Man games have never been consistent in that respect, but the quality of swinging is by far the most variable. Here, the web's attached to buildings. It looks and feels incredible, but relatively, it's very restrictive. What do Spider-Man fans want more? 
I honestly can't tell. That's down to you to decide. Swinging and combat to me are by far the most important aspects of a Spider-Man game. I like a more hands-off narrative that lets me get to what I like fast. This is why Web of Shadows is among my favourite games ever made, and it's why I can't decide which game I like more. But I know that I'm likely in the minority. And therefore, because Spider-Man PS4 does every major aspect of a Spider-Man game, if not the all-time best, then at least, well, it is the best Spider-Man game ever made. Far superior overall to Ultimate, 2, and Web of Shadows. Insomniac should be proud. I wish it wasn't a PS4 exclusive so everyone could play it, but I know its sequel will probably be a launch title for the PS5, so all the webheads will know which console, if any, to buy. This is the point where I'd usually end the video, but since a sequel is all but guaranteed, I'd like to speculate and suggest a few things first. Where story is concerned, I believe that Venom and Green Goblin will play a major part in it. Osborne has been disgraced, Brian Interhar has teased at Venom, and there was of course the symbiote at the end. I thought that Miles would be the main character for this initially, but you can't have Venom without Parker, so I imagine Miles will be a supporting character. We also have to realise that Miles doesn't have any experience whatsoever, so won't have abilities comparable to Peter's. I'm sure he'll have gameplay integration, maybe like how Arkham Knight did it with duo team-ups. This game had, I think, 10 villains, and I don't think many of those are coming back. Spider-Man's running out of bad guys. What have we got left? Carnage, maybe, if they want to do it in the same game as Venom. A Mysterio return. Sandman. Juggernaut. Hobgoblin. But Hobgoblin probably won't happen in the same game as Green Goblin. Same deal with Jack-O-Lantern. And Lizard's already dealt with. I hope they won't have to scrape the bottom of the barrel. With regards to gameplay, there's room for improvement everywhere. Stealth and swinging could do with far more depth, and combat needs more refinement mechanically. The gadgets, though, need to be completely revised. Other than that, they have an incredible foundation to work off. If this game isn't a masterpiece, the next game sure as hell can be. Spider-Man PS4 is one of those rare few games that lives up to the hype, or at least gets close. Yet another Sony exclusive that comes out a beautifully polished and rich experience. But it's not over yet. This game will have three DLC packs, one for every remaining month of 2018, and I will be reviewing them all after the last one comes out in December. So if you'd like to see that, or enjoyed this video and want more, consider subscribing. I've got videos on Spider-Man Web of Shadows, Iron Man, Destiny 2, all the Crisis and Fear games, and a couple of recent racing games too. If you'd like to help keep the channel afloat, at times when CPM is lower than MJ's standards, I've got a Patreon and a donation link. I'd also like to shout out Pixel Hipster, a small video essay channel with some very nice editing who's working very hard to gain a following. There might also be some recommended channels in the description if I remember to link them. 